Mazes in Python, Part 1, Building and Visualizing. If you're up for a challenge and would like to take your programming skills to the next level, then you've come to the right place. In this two-part video course, you'll practice object-oriented programming, amongst several other good practices, while building a maze solver project in Python. From reading a maze from a binary file, to visualizing it using scalable vector graphics, to finding the shortest path from the entrance to the exit, you'll go step by step through the guided process of building a complete and working project. In this part of the course, you'll learn how to use an object-oriented approach to represent a maze in memory, and visualize the maze and its solution using scalable vector graphics. In the second part, you'll define a specialized binary file format to store the maze on disk, transform the maze into a traversable weighted graph, and use graph search algorithms in the Network X library to find the solution. This course will best suit intermediate Python developers who'd like to practice object-oriented programming while building a cool project. Throughout this tutorial, you'll be using several features of modern Python, so make sure you're on Python 3.10 or later. In addition, it may be worth brushing up on the topics on screen before you dive in. RealPython has you covered with all of these, and you'll find links in the accompanying materials to all of them, or you can use the search tool on the site to find the course you're looking for. But note that you don't need to be an expert in any of these areas to follow along with the course, as it will guide you through the steps involved. In fact, a key aspect of your learning experience will be seeing these features in a practical context. You may then want to take a deeper dive into areas of interest when you've seen them in action. Any code that you see running in the REPL will be using the bPython interpreter. This is a replacement Python interpreter that offers a number of enhancements, including code highlighting and suggestions, but any code you see running on screen will work in the standard Python REPL, which is typically accessed by typing Python or Python 3 at your terminal or command line prompt. At the end of this two-part course, you'll have a command line maze solver that can load your maze from a binary file and show the solution in a web browser. You'll also learn how to build your own mazes from scratch and save them on disk. So now you know what's going to be covered, let's get started. Project Overview On screen you can see the expected file structure of the project. Once finished, the project's file and directory tree will look like this. Yes, that is a lot of files, but don't worry. Most of them are fairly short, and some contain only a few lines of code. This helps to keep things organized and makes the individual pieces reusable, letting you compose them in new ways. Granularity like this plays an important role in Python projects with larger code bases. It avoids the notorious circular dependency error that you may encounter if various parts of the code were in one big file. The SRC subfolder contains your Python modules and packages for the Maze Solver project. The Maze Solver package consists of several sub packages that group logically related code fragments, including models, the building blocks of the maze and its solution, view, the visualization of the graph with scalable vector graphics. This structure will be added to in part two of this course when you add extra features such as binary file storage and solving the maze. There will also be the special dundermain.py file which makes the enclosing package runnable so that you will eventually be able to execute it directly from the command line using Python's M option. When launched like this, the package will read the specified file with your maze. After solving the maze, it renders the solution into an SVG format embedded in a temporary HTML file. The file is automatically opened in the default web browser. You'll also be able to run the same Python code using a shortcut command. This will work as long as the solve command isn't already taken or aliased by another program. PyProject.toml provides your project's configuration, metadata and dependencies defined in the toml format. 
Eventually, the project will depend on one external library, which you'll use to find the shortest path in the maze, represented as a graph. There is quite a bit of code involved in this project, so if you get stuck at any point, remember to download the accompanying materials and compare your code with the final code that's provided. So now you've seen more detail on what you're going to be coding, in the next section of the course, you'll actually start creating the project. Lay the groundwork for the project. The first step to writing any code starts on paper. So you'll now take a step back to figure out the problem that you're solving and how you're going to approach it. The first step is to narrow down the design requirements of the maze. Mazes come in different shapes and forms, but you'll concentrate on one kind that you'd find in a typical maze puzzle video game from the early 1980s, such as Boulder Dash or Sokoban. The maze seen on screen was inspired by the classic Pac-Man game. This maze is enclosed in a rectangle comprising a grid of square cells that form passages along straight lines. Therefore, paths in the maze will only be vertical or horizontal rather than diagonal or circular, and each cell will be one unit wide. This will become important for calculating and comparing the distances later. Note that you can give your maze any shape by surrounding it with empty squares marked as exterior to form an open space. However, you might want to align the maze's edges with the enclosing rectangle to save some memory. An additional restriction that you'll impose on your maze is that it must have exactly one entrance and one exit, both of which should occupy distinct cells. A few alternative paths can connect them, including paths with cycles that lead back to a place you've already visited. Solving the maze means finding a path leading from the entrance to the exit. Each solution should include acyclic paths. In other words, a single path location should only be traversed once without backtracking. You also want to consider only the shortest paths while disregarding less optimal meandering ones. However, defining the shortest distance is subject to interpretation, as you'll find out in part 2. In part 2, you'll also introduce enemies and rewards to the maze, so that your hypothetical player can collect extra points and avoid obstacles. But how do you actually find the way out of the maze? Mazes are a perfect example of graph theory in action. As it turns out, you can represent your maze with an undirected graph, consisting of nodes and edges connecting them. Each node or vertex is where two or more paths intersect, while edges are the connections between those intersections. Apart from the nodes representing the intersections and dead ends in the maze, there are a few extra nodes in the graph seen on screen that capture the presence of enemies and rewards. By associating numeric weights with edges that pass through them, you can influence the cost of the given connection. Later, you'll add nodes for corners to make plotting the path from the entrance to the exit a little bit easier. It's worth noting that you can draw the same graph in different ways without changing its underlying structure. For example, you could draw all edges as straight lines, let them cross each other, or arrange the nodes in a certain pattern. Mathematically, a graph is nothing more than a set of nodes and edges which you can lay out in any order and locations that you want. This means that transforming the maze into a graph is an irreversible process resulting in losing some information about its visual features. At the same time, a graph is a remarkably convenient representation for finding the shortest path in the maze. Finding the shortest path belongs in the second part of this course, but you won't be implementing any of the graph traversal algorithms seen on screen for finding it. Instead, you'll be using the NetworkX library, which already implements these and more algorithms to do the work for you. Now that you've clarified the problem at hand, you can start thinking about how to approach it from a technical perspective. It's time to lay the groundwork for some Python code, and that's what you'll be doing in the next section of the course. Scaffold the project structure. The first step is to use your favourite code editor or a cloud-based IDE to create a new Python project while specifying an isolated virtual environment for the dependencies needed. The minimum interpreter version required for this project is Python 3.10 due to a few syntactic constructs that you'll be using. If you can, consider switching to a more recent release for better performance and other improvements. 
If you want to know about managing multiple Python versions on your computer, then take a look at this Real Python course. Once you have the project set up in your editor, scaffold the initial folder structure with these two nested Python packages, both of which should be empty at this point. By placing the project's root package under the SRC subfolder, you follow the so-called source layout convention for organizing files in a project. Note that the pyproject.toml file should live outside of the SRC subfolder. The alternative is a flat layout with all the files in the same folder. You can read about their differences in the official Python packaging user guide. In a nutshell, the SRC layout is preferred for larger projects because it allows you to better separate the project code from other files such as tests. While the project's name is maze solver with a hyphen, you named the corresponding Python package using an underscore to form a valid Python identifier, which follows the same rules as variable names. The rules for naming a Python project or a distribution package in slightly more technical terms are more liberal. If you're curious enough, you can check out PEP 508 to find the regular expression that validates these names. To install your project in an active virtual environment, you'll need to specify the minimum required configuration in the TOML file. This will include the name and the version of the project. Go ahead and open the pyproject.toml file and enter the content seen on screen. This is a pretty standard configuration and a good starting point for most Python projects and libraries. Note that you don't have to explicitly state the folder layout you're using because build tools such as setup tools will automatically find the Python source code. If you're planning to publish your package on PyPI, then you should pick a globally unique name that won't conflict with an existing Python distribution package. Other than this, you have a fair amount of freedom in choosing your project name. It's good practice to work in a Python virtual environment when you're working with third-party packages or installing your own. So on screen, you'll see one being created on macOS with the commands that will also work on Linux. And here are the commands needed when working on Windows. After you've saved your changes in the pyproject.toml file, you can install MazeSolver with pip by running the command seen on screen from the root directory of the project. During the development of a source layout project, it's advisable to use the editable tag or its E alias to ensure that any changes you make to your code are immediately reflected in the virtual environment. Otherwise, you'd need to manually reinstall the package each time you edit the code. If you run into an error about not being able to install the directory in editable mode due to a missing setup.py or setup.cfg file, then you may need to upgrade pip itself. To confirm that you've successfully installed the maze solver package in your virtual environment, open up your REPL and try importing the package. If everything works fine, then you shouldn't see any output or error messages after running this line of code. Otherwise, you'll immediately get a module not found error. With the scaffolded Python project in place, you can now proceed to coding an object-oriented representation of the maze, and that's what you'll be doing next. Represent the maze using an object-oriented approach. At this point, you'll know what kind of maze you'll be solving and have a good idea of the best data structure to represent it with. In this part of the course, you'll use a top-down approach to conceptually decompose the maze into a set of basic elements. One by one, you'll implement those elements as objects and combine them to represent the complete maze. For the purposes of this course, you can think of the maze as a rectangular grid of uniform squares arranged in rows and columns.
Each square has the same width and height and a piece of border around it. Squares can additionally play specific roles in the maze to make it more interesting. For example, some of them can represent obstacles such as walls or enemies, and others can represent rewards. To avoid tight coupling between your building blocks which could manifest itself through the circular import error mentioned earlier on, you're going to put the individual classes in separate files. Go ahead and create the four Python module placeholders seen on screen in the models package. Each empty file corresponds to one of the building blocks you've identified. Over the remaining sections, you'll fill them in with necessary code. You'll begin by defining the available roles of a square in the maze. Most squares won't have a particular role in the maze. However, at least two of them must be marked as entrance and exit respectively. They'll tell the pathfinding algorithm where to start and finish its journey. Some other squares can be marked as obstacles, such as walls, enemies, or the exterior, which you can't cross. Finally, a few squares can contain rewards, such as bonus points or power-ups that may influence the path. Here's the same maze that you saw earlier, but with a few of its squares annotated so you can get a better idea of their different roles. There are six unique roles you can assign to the squares in any given maze. Enemy, Entrance, Exit, Exterior, Reward and Wall. A role is optional, so the square doesn't have any by default. On the other hand, when a square already has a role, then it can't have another role at the same time. For instance, you can't place a reward and an enemy on the same square. Note that this is just an arbitrary constraint on the problem to make it easier to solve, which doesn't hold true for all mazes in general. The most appropriate data type for representing square roles in Python, which can enforce these rules, is an enum. It lets you choose at most one role from a fixed set of mutually exclusive values. Open the role module in your project and define the class as seen on screen. The class extends the enum intinum base class from the standard library, which provides special semantics for its instances. There are currently only six such instances, which have unique identities called members of the enumeration. You usually write their names in uppercase to indicate they behave like constants, but unlike regular constants, they share a common namespace. By calling enum auto, you give each member the next numeric value in turn. At this point, it doesn't make much difference whether you extend enum intinum or the more basic enum enum type. However, the benefit of using the former will become apparent in part two of this course, where you'll start implementing a custom file format to save your mazes on disk in binary form. Because enum intinum is also a subclass of int, as the name implies, you can treat your role members as numbers. Even though regular enumerations defined with enum, enum would have identical numeric values, they don't support operators associated with maths expressions, such as the plus operator. You'll use this feature to combine roles with other information about the square. Remember that a role is optional, therefore you could use a special null value to indicate the lack of a role in a given square. In Python, that null value is the built-in none. However, empty values can be problematic because they force you to add a conditional branch to your code that will handle the missing value whenever you want to access an attribute. If you forget to check for a none value, then you may get an error. Fortunately, in the object-oriented world, there's a convenient design pattern called the null object pattern which can help you avoid this issue. In short, the pattern instructs you to stop using none in favour of dedicated null objects representing the missing value of the associated types. Generally, each attribute type should have its own null object that can implement the desired interface with some default behaviour, such as a no-op.
To follow this pattern in your role enumeration, specify an additional member that will serve as the null object. Because enum auto starts enumerating your members from one and then picks up the value of the previous member, the default values may not always be desirable. If you'd like to change them, then you can explicitly set an arbitrary value for some members, such as using zero for the null object's value, as this feels more appropriate than one. Now you can assign a role instance to all of the squares, even if some of them don't play an inherent role in the maze. That way you can treat the squares in a uniform manner, which will greatly simplify the code written in future. So far, you've defined roles for the squares in the maze. Its next building block is the border around each square, which will let you give them a visual appearance and sense of location. You'll be looking at creating these border patterns in the next section of the course. Creating border patterns. Each square can have between zero and four sides painted along the main compass directions, north, south, east, and west. When you do the math, you'll find out that there are 16 combinations of unique side patterns in total, ranging from an empty square to one with all four sides painted. There's one empty square, four squares with only one side, six squares with two sides, four squares with three sides, and one square with all four sides. Now you can build almost any maze pattern with these tiles by connecting them like a jigsaw puzzle. To compactly represent a border pattern around a square with just a single number, you should consider using a bit field. This will map each of the four sides to a specific binary digit. Extracting information from such a number usually requires the use of bitwise operators, which aren't very common in Python. However, in this course, you'll use a handy shortcut from the standard library, which hides the details. Because there are four sides, you must allocate four bits that you can individually turn on or off depending on whether or not there's a border on that side. When you convert the corresponding bit string into a decimal number, you'll get the unambiguous representation of one of the border patterns as seen on screen. As you can see, each border pattern is represented with a decimal number ranging from 0 to 15. You can check which sides are included in the border by looking at the binary representation of the number and reading the corresponding bits. If a bit is set to 1, then you know that you should paint that side of the border. The bit count, or the number of ones in the bit string, reflects the number of sides in the border. Additionally, it carries some useful information about the type of square. For example, you can recognize a dead end by detecting precisely three sides of the border, leaving only one end to connect with other squares. Fewer than two sides may indicate a potential intersection of paths in the maze if the square isn't a wall or part of the exterior. A T-shaped intersection will have one side, while a four-way intersection will have none. Detecting a corner is a bit more tricky because it requires you to compare the border against one of the four specific patterns, even though they all have exactly two sides. This helps eliminate the other two border patterns that also have two sides but aren't corners. Their sides run in parallel instead of meeting at a corner. So now that you know what makes a square border, how do you define it in Python? You'll use the enum data type again, but with a slight twist. This time around, you'll extend the enum int flag base class, which is an even more specific enumeration type that implements the bit field logic. You'll give more common names to your enum members instead of using the compass directions. Add the code seen on screen to the border module. You override the value of border empty with zero to indicate the absence of border sides. This class resembles the role enumeration that you defined earlier, but int flag allows you to do much more with its members. Rather than being a mutually exclusive choice of one member, the border enumeration lets you combine any number of its members to create a composite value. For example, to define a closed border, you'd combine all four sides using the bitwise OR operator like this.
The name and value attributes of the resulting border are calculated dynamically based on the combination of its sides. Note that the order of the individual sides doesn't matter when you define a composite bit field. Underneath, it's a numeric value resulting from turning on the specific bits. Python will always show a consistent text representation of that value determined by the order of your members in the class definition. To compare your border to another border pattern, you can use the identity test operator is. Alternatively, you could use the equality test operator equals equals to directly compare your border against a known numeric value. Additionally, you can check if the border contains a given side by using the membership test operator in. Comparing an instance of a num int flag to a number is possible because the flag is a subclass of the built-in integer type, just like a num int num which you used before. Next, add a few convenience properties to the enumeration so that you can detect corners, dead ends and intersections. All three properties return a boolean value. In the corner property, you use the membership test operator in to check if an instance of the border enumeration, indicated by self, is one of the predefined corners. The other two properties rely on the integer's bit count method, which returns the number of ones in a binary representation of your border. With the role and border building blocks in place, you can now tie them together on a higher abstraction level, and in the next section you'll implement the square class. Model the square. The purpose of a square is to convey information about a particular location in the maze. Therefore, every square should have known coordinates that can determine its position. The square should also have a border pattern that describes the maze structure at that location. Depending on the purpose of the square, it may optionally play a special role, for example, indicating the maze entrance. You've already done the hard work by offloading most of these responsibilities to helper classes. The only remaining task is to combine them into a final square object. Open the square module and enter this code. You're using Python's data class to generate the mundane code for you, which will correctly initialize instances of this class, amongst a few other things. Enabling the frozen parameter ensures that square objects become immutable after you create them. There's no point in changing the values of the instance variables once they're set. Preferring immutable objects over mutable ones where possible is considered a good programming practice, which can prevent subtle bugs caused by unexpected changes in data. Note that in addition to storing the square's row and column indices, you also keep track of its one-dimensional index within a flat sequence of squares. This way, the search algorithm can uniquely identify the squares. While you could theoretically infer the index from the row and column, you'd also need to know the width and height of the maze which are none of the squares' business. A little redundancy can sometimes keep data encapsulated. When creating your square instance, you must specify its index, row, column, and border pattern, but the role is completely optional. If you skip the role in the initializer, then the square will assume role none by default. And that's it, you successfully modeled the square data type, so all the building blocks are now in place to build the maze. And that's what you'll be doing in the next section of the course. Building the maze.
At the very core, a maze is an ordered collection of squares which you can represent with a Python tuple. However, you'll eventually want to augment your maze model with additional properties and methods, so it makes sense to wrap the sequence of squares in a custom class right away. Enter the code seen on screen into the maze module. Here, you use an immutable data class again to ensure that the underlying tuple of square objects remains unchanged once assigned. You might be inclined to use a Python list instead of a tuple to keep your squares, but that would prevent you from caching partial results of your computations later. Python's cache requires memorized function arguments to be hashable and therefore immutable. To avoid the extra work when looping over the squares or when accessing one of them by index, you can make your class iterable and subscriptable by implementing these two special methods. This method lets maze instances cooperate with a for loop, while the second one enables square bracket notation for getting squares by index. Next, you might want to calculate the width and height of the maze, knowing the column and row indices of the underlying squares. You take advantage of the iterable nature of the maze by iterating over it to find the maximum column and row index of its squares with the help of the max function. Adding one to the highest index accounts for the zero-based numbering of tuple indices. Because looping is a relatively expensive operation, you cache the return values with Functool's cached property instead of using the built-in property decorator. As a result, the width and height are computed only once on demand, while their subsequent invocations will return the cached value. The benefit of calculating the maze size by hand is data consistency. If you supplied the width and height through two extra parameters in the class, then there would be no guarantee that the rows and columns would match up with the flat index. So inferring the size from the squares avoids this potential problem. Speaking of consistency, you can also include the validation of the maze by looping over it again when it's created to make sure that its squares have the expected rows and columns with matching indices. To do that, you'll leverage the special method dunder post init to hook into the initialization process of the data class. The first function checks whether the index property of each square fits into a continuous sequence of numbers that enumerates all the squares in the maze. The second function iterates over the rows and columns in the maze. And this ensures that the row and column attributes of the corresponding square match up with the current row and column of the loops. Watch out for proper indentation of these functions as they don't belong in the class body. Both validation functions rely on the assert statement to raise the assertion error and prevent the maze from being created in the case of invalid data. Earlier, you decided that a maze must have an entrance and an exit, so it's worth confirming that it has both. Go ahead and add two more validation functions. First, role is imported, as this will be needed in the new validation functions. Then the validation functions are added to the dunder post init method. Finally, the functions are added to the bottom of the file. These count the number of squares whose role is either entrance or exit, and verify that there's exactly one of each.
For your convenience, you might as well implement the relevant properties that will return squares with those special roles. This code calls next on a generator expression that filters the squares by their role. Because you already validated them, you can safely assume that the appropriate squares exist in the maze and next won't raise any exception. At long last, you can finally build your first maze using the building blocks defined earlier. This maze will be needed a number of times in this course, so to save having to type it out multiple times in a REPL session, you'll put it inside the mazes directory at the top level of the project, at the same level as the SRC folder. This will keep it out of the way of the main project, but it will mean you'll need to start your REPL session at that level later on when you want to import it. This sample maze has 12 squares with 10 unique border patterns arranged in three rows and four columns. The entrance to the maze is located in the bottom left corner, while the exit is in the first row, slightly to the right. These squares are created at index 2 and 8. Being able to visualize the final result just by looking at the code is quite a niche skill, so on screen you can see what the maze would look like. It may not be a masterpiece, but having a small dataset sample to work with is beneficial for several reasons. When something doesn't work as expected, you'll be able to spot the problem much quicker. You'll also have a better understanding of the underlying concepts, allowing you to debug code more efficiently. Finally, because there's little data to process, you'll spend a lot less time waiting for the results in your development cycle. So far, you've identified the building blocks of the maze and implemented them in Python. But now you can build a maze, the next step will be to figure out how to display it in a graphical form, and that's what you'll be doing in the next section of the course.